By the end of this video, you'll learn everything there is to know about creating multi-step forms using Bubble. Now this covers everything from when and why you should use a multi-step form, how to design the elements on your page, how to show and hide each section of the form, how to submit the form as an entry in your database, and finally, how to create your own custom progress bar from scratch. Of course, it goes without saying that everything we're gonna build today won't require a single line of code. Look, at this point, I've rambled on for too long. Let's open up our bubble editor and we can get started. Within this tutorial today, there is just so much that I wanna cover. So what I've done is I've just taken the time to create a checklist of all of the items that I'm gonna highlight. Now, when it comes to this checklist, I'll be sure to include a link to this in the description of this video. I personally just like to use a tool called Notion, which just allows me to check items off as I add them into my build. And look, it's just a great way to keep track of where we are throughout the process. And of course, if you have a version of this, you can follow along too. Now, the first thing on my list is that I just wanna talk about the importance of multi-step forms and when you might use them inside a bubble. And I think that the best way to understand this is truly just by showing you a real world example. So this is an example of the form that we're gonna to recreate today. Now, in my example today, what I'm doing is I'm creating a new business lead within something like a CRM. So I'm just asking someone to add in all of the details about their business. Now, if you're brand new to Bubble and you're creating a form, Traditionally, the easiest way to do this is to create just a bunch of separate pages. And then after someone fills in some information on the first page, you can just create a navigation event and send them through to the next page. But look, there's a lot of reasons why you shouldn't go down that path. The first one is of course, the fact that you're gonna have so many damn pages inside of your app that you just don't really need. And the other main point is that it's just going to be a very slow and tedious process for your end user. So every single time you have to send someone between pages, You've got to wait for the new page to load and if you've got a bit of content on there it just slows down the whole user experience whereas when it comes to this multi-step form here today as you'll see as soon as i hit this next button it just snaps right to the next step of our process so all of this is completely instantaneous and i can easily just go back and forward between all of the different sections so from an end user experience this is far superior now throughout our tutorial today i'm going to explain absolutely everything we need to know about recreating this exact form from all of the different groups and the sections of this form right up to the progress bar that you see at the top. And so what we're gonna do is jump straight into my bubble editor and I'm gonna get right into it. So what I've done in my bubble editor is I've created another page which looks the exact same as the form I just shown you. But at this point in time, the only thing I've done on this page is just add a navigation menu, which you don't need to worry about, as well as three different groups that are going to sit on my page. Now, when you're creating a multi-step form, the way you actually do this is, of course, not by sending users to different pages, but you just add a bunch of groups onto your page, and then you hide and display each relevant group at each particular point throughout your form. So as you can see, I have three separate groups here. The first group is the group you saw in step one. The second group was step two, and the third group was, of course, step three. Now, when I'm working with groups, I like to think of groups as little pages inside of your overall page. And the main reason for that is because they essentially are. Groups are super powerful. They allow you to store data in them, you can hide them, you can display them, and of course you can store a bunch of different elements inside of them. Now, before we actually look at how I've structured all of my input fields within my form, today I just wanna quickly highlight what I'm gonna be building. So as I mentioned before, I wanna create, let's say something like a CRM, so something like Salesforce, and let's say I want a lead to add in all of the information about their company. Within my data tab here, I have a data type known as a lead. And inside of this, I just have a bunch of different fields that are asking someone to store their information. So things like the company name, the contact number, the contact email, their team size, their team skills, and just a bunch of other information. Now, I imagine none of this is relevant to the form you're trying to create, but I just wanted to highlight this because my end goal of this tutorial is create a new lead entry inside of my database. So if we jump back to our design tab, you can see I've broken this down into three separate sections. And the reason for that is because if I was to add all of these fields on one single page, it's gonna overwhelm the end user. They're gonna see, let's say 10 to 15 different fields, and to be honest, they're just gonna say, stuff that, that's a whole lot of data I need to add in. I don't wanna have to think about all of that right now. Whereas if you create a multi-step form, it just breaks it down into more bite-sized pieces. And so that's exactly what I've done today. I've created a few standard input fields in my first group. I've got some drop-down menus in my second group. And within my third group, I just have some multi-line input fields to add in some longer text. 
And look, there's nothing special about these groups. You can design these however you would like. And I'm not gonna jump too much into the process of my design thoughts, because right now we're focused on building a form, not learning how to actually build groups. But as I mentioned, for every single step of your form, you're gonna need to have a separate group. And this is the first tip I have when it comes to creating multi-step forms. When you double click on your groups here, you should name these accordingly. So as you can see, this group here is called group number one. My second group is called group number two, and my third group is called group number three. But you just need a way to easily differentiate between all of the groups, because later on, we're gonna build out some workflows that hide and display these groups. So we need to know which group we should hide and which group we should display. Then after you've taken the time to update the naming conventions of your group, this is where you can add all of the input fields that you need to store information for. So as I mentioned within my first group, I've just got a bunch of standard input fields. And if you're building a form in real time as you watch this tutorial, I'd recommend just pausing this now and taking the time to add all of the input fields you need within your first group. Then once you've done that, if you're up to speed right now, what you'll need to do is add a button within your first group. And as you'll see, within my first group here, there's only one button. Whereas in my other two groups, there were two buttons. And the reason for that is because when you're at step one of our form, you can only go forwards, you can't go backwards. So that's why I just added one button here that takes up the entire width of my group. And of course it has some margin around it, so it doesn't touch the borders of the group itself. But the other important thing I just wanna highlight is that this button here has also been named accordingly. So this is my button next group number one. And you'll see that this is also a common theme throughout all of my buttons on my form today. So in group number two, what I've done is I've just added two buttons into my group. And as you can see, they currently sit inside of a red group. So I left that colored for the sake of our tutorial, just so you can see that these two buttons are in another group where the container layout is a row because I'm stacking these horizontally across my page. But if I was to click on my second button here, which is my next button, this is called button next group number two. Now, of course, the reason why I've updated the names of these buttons is because all of these buttons share the exact same text inside of them. So they're all just called button next. And look, if I'm building workflows in a moment that run whenever my next buttons are clicked, it's gonna be quite confusing because I won't know which workflow belongs to which particular section of our form. So once again, that's why it's so important to update the naming conventions of all of the buttons within your form. And of course, because we're in group number two here or step number two of our form, a user can either go forwards or backwards. So that's why I have two buttons. And if I select on my back button here, you can see that this is the back button that belongs to my group number two. So once again, I know exactly where this button sits in the chain of all of the steps in my form. And then if we scroll on down to the very last group here and look at my example today, I just have three groups, but look, you can have one, two, 10, 20, as many as you would like. What you'll notice is that within my last group here, the button at the bottom right hand side doesn't say next, it actually says submit. So when this button is clicked, I obviously don't wanna to jump to another step within my form. I wanna actually submit that form inside of my database. But that being said, when I duplicated this button across, I made a copy of my next button. So that's why it's called button next group three. If I really wanted, I could update this to be called button submit, but I would still just wanna highlight that this is in group three on my page. And look, I've done the same thing for my back button. This is called button back group number three. And so once again, if you're creating your form as you watch this tutorial, I'd recommend just pausing the tutorial right now and making sure that you add all of the buttons as well as update the naming conventions of those buttons. Because trust me, it's gonna save you a whole lot of headache as we now start to build out all of the workflows. So I'm just gonna quickly jump back to my Notion checklist here and just tick off that we've reviewed the example of the form that we're gonna to build today. And then when it comes to the design process, we've reviewed the structure of our database, I've designed group number one, I've updated the naming conventions of the actual group itself, I've added all of my input fields, I've also updated the naming convention of the button that actually sits inside of the group. And then for group number two, when I built this out, I just made a copy of group number one, I made sure to update the name of that group, I added all of my new input fields, I added that back button because when you're in group two, you can either go forwards or backwards. And of course, I also updated the naming conventions of the buttons. And then of course, with group number three, we did the exact same thing. So at this point in time, we should have designed our form and it's time to move on to the next step within our process. And that is creating the custom states. And look, this is where most people get confused or overwhelmed when it comes to creating a multi-step form. 
So this is where I'm gonna try and break things down into as much detail as I can. So if we jump over into our bubble editor, as I mentioned, right now, all of these three groups are currently visible on my page. So if I run a preview of this page here, what you're gonna see is that I can scroll on down and see all of these three groups. And that's not the experience we wanna to create today. As I said before, we wanna hide and display these groups based on where we are throughout the process of the actual form submission. So when this page is loaded, this first group should be the only group that's visible. Then when we click next, our second group should be the only group that's visible and so on. And so what we need to do is create some sort of way to recognize or store the information of which form or group of our form should be displayed at any point in time. And when you're looking to store information inside of your app, there's two ways in which you can do this. You can store data inside of your database, which is probably the most common way that you're familiar with at this point in time. But when it comes to storing the information of which group should be displayed, I just think that's a bit unnecessary. Because when you think about it, we could have 10 different users using this exact same form at the same time. So what we'd need to do is create a data field under each individual user and just try and recognize which step of our form should be displayed. Now look, in my opinion, that's unnecessary information we're storing under the user. Particularly if you've got multiple forms throughout your app, that's gonna be a lot of data fields. So the other way in which you can store data inside of your application is by using a custom state. Now, if you're not familiar with custom states, they're just a way of temporarily storing data or information inside of a page directly. So you're not actually storing it inside of your database, but you're just storing it on your page. Now, like anything in Bubble, there's pros and cons to using custom states. But in our example today, a custom state is exactly what we need to use. So what I wanna to do today is create a way to store the information of which group should be displayed. So I'm gonna create a custom state that says, hey, right now group number one should be displayed. And then when we click next, I'm gonna tell Bubble that right now group number one should be hidden and group number two should be shown. And of course, then we'll do the exact same thing for group number three. So in order to create a custom state, all you need to do is double click on your overall page. So my page today is called the multi-step form. And if we head over to this little information icon, it's gonna open up what I like to refer to as the wardrobe to Narnia. This is a very hidden menu inside of Bubble, but it's incredibly powerful. And look inside of this menu, which is known as the element inspector, you're gonna see the option to add a new custom state. And if you're brand new to custom states, what you might notice is that the process of creating a custom state here looks very similar to the process of creating a data field in your database. And that's because we're essentially just creating a data field that's going to sit on our page only, not within our database. So for this custom state, we can store whatever type of information we would like. And so today, what I'm gonna do is create three different custom states. My first custom state is going to be called display group one. And for the state type, I'm gonna scroll on down and select that this should be a yes, no value. So we either do wanna display group number one or we don't wanna display group number one. So I'm gonna to choose to create this here. And now by default, whenever our page is loaded, I would like to display group number one. So I'm actually gonna set a default value here to equal yes. I'm then gonna create another custom state and I'm gonna call this display group two. But for this state type, once again, it's gonna be a yes, no value. I'll choose to create this. But for our second custom state here, I wanna set the default value to equal no because by default, I don't wanna display group number two. I only wanna display it whenever this next button is clicked within group number one. Then finally, we're gonna create one more custom state, and this is going to be called display group three. The state type will be a yes, no value. We'll choose to create this here, and the default value will once again be no, because group number three should not be displayed by default. Now at this point in time, we've created these custom states in our page, but what we now need to do is build out some workflows that are going to update these custom states. So that way we can jump between all of the different groups inside of our form. So what I'm gonna do is choose to close my element inspector here, and I'm gonna click on my next button here within group number one. So this is button next group one. Within this, we're gonna choose to add a workflow. And within this workflow, if we just type in the word state, we're gonna set the state of an element. And the element is of course my overall page. So once again, I've called this the multi-step form. And now you'll see the option to reference all of the custom states that we've just added. So if someone's in group number one or step number one of our form and they click the next button, what I'm gonna do is first of all, update the display group number one state, which by default was yes. And I'm now gonna set this to equal no. So this group should not be shown. 
I'm then going to choose to set another state and that state will be group number two. And in this case, I do want this group to be shown. And this is everything we need to change within this workflow here. So we're going to jump back to our design tab. Then we can scroll on down to our next group. So in group number two here, when the next button is clicked, what I'd like to do is set the custom state to then display group number three. So I'm going to click on my second next button, which is my button next group number two. I'm going to choose to add a workflow and we're going to pretty much do the exact same thing. So I'm going to type in the word state. I'm going to set the state of an element and the element of course will be our multi-step form. And in this case, I'm going to set the display group number two state to now equal no, because I want to hide group number two. And then I'm going to set another state and that custom state will be display group number three, because what I'd like to now do is of course display the third group. So I'm going to set this to equal yes. And look, after building out this workflow, as you can see, it's a pretty straightforward process. We're going to go from group number one to two, group number two to three. And then of course, in the last group later on, we're going to build out a workflow that actually submits this form. But the other thing we just need to remember is that inside of group number two and three, we have these back buttons as well. So if someone gets to group number two or step number two within our form, and they realize that they want to change some information within group number one, they should be able to click this back button and it will obviously hide group number two and then redisplay group number one. So what we need to do is build out two additional workflows to factor for this experience. And so this is where things can get a little bit complex. You just need to make sure you take the time to think about all of these scenarios within our form today. So I'm just going to double click on my back button here. So this is back button group number two. And I'm going to choose to add a workflow in this group. And once again, I'm going to choose to set the state of an element. Now, of course, the element is going to be my overall page. And in this case, if group number two is being displayed and someone wants to go back, we need to update the display group number two state to now equal no. And then I'm going to set the display group number one state to equal yes. And then we're going to need to do the exact same thing for the back button in group number three here. So for back button group three, I'll add a workflow, set the state of an element. The element will be my page. And in this case, I'm going to set the display group three custom state to equal no, because that is the group that's currently being displayed before someone hits the back button. And if we're going back in the process, we're going to set the display group two state to now equal yes. And now at this point in time, you can start to see that we're adding quite a few workflows onto our page. So one thing I like to do is color code my workflows so I can easily tell the difference between which of my next workflows and which of my back workflows. So for my back workflows here, because we're going backwards, I'm going to click on the workflow trigger and set the event color to be red. I'll do the exact same thing for my other workflow. And for my next workflows, I'm going to set the event colors to be green because we're advancing forward. It's nice and straightforward. So right now I can easily differentiate between which workflow send me forward and which workflow send me back. And look, when it comes to building out the workflows for our custom states, that is absolutely everything we need to do. So what we're going to do is just quickly jump back to our Notion checklist and tick off that we've finished building out all of the custom states on our page, as well as finish building out all of the workflows that actually update the values of those custom states. And from here, as we scroll down our page, the next thing we need to do is create a way to hide and display each group within our form. And this is where we're going to start to create conditions on our groups. So right now, if I was to jump into my bubble editor and once again, run a preview of this page here, what you'll still notice is that although we've taken the time to add custom states into our page, all three groups are still being displayed. Now, why is that? If we were to jump back into bubble and scroll on up to group number one and double click on this group within our layout tab, what you'll notice is that this has a default setting to display this element whenever the page is loaded. So by default, this group will always be shown. Now, what we need to do today is actually hide all of our groups by default and make sure they're not displayed on our page. Then we're going to create a condition that recognizes, hey, this group should only be shown when the value of its custom state is set to yes, not no. So what we're going to do is uncheck that this group should be visible on page load. And I'm going to tick this option to collapse this group when it's hidden. Now, what that just means is that when this group is not being shown, it's not going to take up any empty space. So the next group can move up and take its place on our page. And because this group is hidden by default, what I now need to do is jump over to my conditional tab and just recognize when it should be shown. So I'm going to define a condition here 
and I'm going to recognize when the actual custom state stored in our page is set to yes. So if I scroll down to the bottom, I'm just going to reference the name of my page, which to be honest, it's gotten lost in all of these options, but it's the multi-step form. So you could just type in the name of your page here and reference that. So I'm going to select when my overall page, when it's display group number one custom state is in fact, yes. What I'd like to do is select that this element should be visible and tick that that should be true. And of course, by default, if you remember, the display group number one custom state is set to yes. So now this group should be shown as soon as the page is loaded. We'll then need to do the exact same thing for our two remaining groups here. So I'm going to select on group number two. I'm going to jump to my layout tab. I will uncheck that this should be visible on page load. I will check the option to collapse this element when it's hidden. I'll then jump over to my conditional tab and I'm just going to recognize when my overall page here when it's display group number two custom state is in fact yes, I'd like to select that this group should be visible and tick that that should be true. And then finally, we'll do the exact same thing for our third group. So I'm gonna click on this here, jump to my layout tab, unselect that this should be visible on page load and collapse this when it's hidden. And look, I sound like a broken record here, but it is the exact same process as before. So now we can jump to our conditional tab, define a condition and just recognize when our overall page when the display group number three state is in fact yes, this element should be visible and I will leave that ticked as true. Now from here, if we were to jump into the preview of our app and refresh this page, what you're gonna see here is that only one group is being shown and that is group number one. Then when I click the next button, group number one will be hidden and group number two will be shown. Then when I click the next button again, group number two will be hidden and group number three will be shown. And of course we can go back between all of the groups as well. So at this point in time, we're about 90% of the way through creating our custom form. This really is the crux of everything you need to know, but there's still a few little specific things I wanna point out. And of course, we're still yet to build our progress bar at the top of our page. Now, one thing I just wanna point out when it comes to a multi-step form is that although you can't see the input fields whenever you jump to the next stage, any data you add into these will remain stored in them. So if I was to add, let's say a company name, I'm gonna say test company and I hit next. Obviously I can't see that input field, but when I go back to it, that information is still going to be stored here. Now, of course, when you refresh your page, it's going to refresh that input field. So that data will no longer appear. The other thing I should point out is that when it comes to custom states, when you refresh the page, they will also be reset. So let's say if I click next and I'm now viewing group number two, so my custom state is display group number two. And then if I refresh the page once again, it's going to automatically reset and send us back to group number one. Now, when it comes to a multi-step form, that is the exact experience we wanna to create today. We wanna to make sure that when the page is reset, someone goes right back to the start. So that way they can add in all of the information in step number one. The other thing I should point out is back inside of our bubble editor, if you remember, we've hidden all of these groups by default. So when I actually refresh my bubble editor itself, what you'll now find is that the page is currently blank. There's nothing on it. And that's because by default, these groups are all hidden. So if you ever want to make changes to these groups or view what they look like on your page, all you need to do is head up to your elements tree here. And if you've got this option selected to show all of your hidden elements, you can see all of our groups. And if you want to show a group, just click the little eye icon next to it and you can either choose to show or hide it. So please don't freak out when you refresh your editor or come back to it later on. All of your groups still are here. They're not gone. And look, while we're still building in our form, the very last thing you'd need to do is of course build out the workflow that runs whenever someone clicks the submit button. Now I'm not going to run through the whole process. I don't want to bore you with this, but all you'd need to do is add a separate workflow here when this is clicked. And in this case, I'd head to my data tab create a new thing and I'd create a new lead. And of course, I just match all of the relevant fields under this data type with all of the input fields on my page. And look, after a form is submitted, I would personally send someone through to another page because right now if they select submit, nothing's gonna happen. They're still just gonna stay stagnant on this page. So they might not know that their form has been submitted. So what I traditionally like to do is select a navigation workflow and I could send someone through to a separate page which just indicates that that form has been submitted. If you really wanted, you could show an alert message, you could reset the values of all of the input fields in your form. There's really no right or wrong way around this, but I personally would just like to send someone through to another page. Now, if we jump back to our Notion checklist, we can tick off that we finished adding in all of the conditions, which of course hid and displayed all of the relevant groups. 
But the very last thing to build out is the custom progress bar. Now this is one of my favorite quality of life features when it comes to any multi-step form. So within my editor, I just have a separate page here with the example of the form that I'd shown you before. And when I run a preview of this, what you'll see is that when we're on step one, this little circle with step number one is highlighted. When I click next, I can see that we're easily on step number two. And then when I click next again, I can see we're on step number three. And now the beauty of a progress bar is it just lets the user know how far along they are throughout the process. And look, there's multiple different ways in which you can add a progress bar. There's plugins for it. But look, in my opinion, those plugins are pretty basic. They don't allow you to create this nice experience where you've got all of these circles in the middle. They only ever allow you to create this one single line across the page, which looks pretty bland in my opinion. So what we're gonna do today is create a brand new progress bar from scratch. And look, it is a little bit tedious, but at this point in time, if you already understand how you can create custom states and conditions, this should hopefully be a walk in the park for you. So what we're gonna do is jump into our bubble editor and we're gonna jump back to my main form here. So this is the page that I've just been working on before. Now at the top of this page, what I'd like to do is create that progress bar. And as you can see on this page, our progress bar is positioned horizontally across my page. So each of these sections you see here are actually group elements. And the way this is going to work today is essentially I'm just gonna add a bunch of different groups on my page, and then I'm just gonna create a condition on each group to update its background color based on the custom state stored in our page. So when the custom state to display group number one is currently set to yes, only this group should have its background color filled in. Then when the display group number two custom state is set to yes, both of these groups and this little bar in the middle here should also have their background colors updated. And so when we're building out our progress bar, I actually am gonna walk through all of the design steps because it can be a little bit technical. So if we jump into Bubble, the first thing we need to do is add a main group to the top of our page. Now the purpose of this group is to store all of our additional groups inside of it. So what I'm gonna do is update the name of this and call this group progress bar. And look, for the sake of our tutorial today, I'm just gonna detach the style of this group and give this a flat background color and set this to be a light shade of red, just so that way you can easily see where this group sits on my page. I'm then gonna jump over to my layout tab and update the container layout to be a row, because as I mentioned, inside of this group, I wanna stack a bunch of different groups horizontally across my page. So a row is the appropriate option. I'm then going to unselect that this should be a fixed width. I'm gonna make this fully responsive by setting the minimum width to zero, but for the maximum width, I'd like this to be the same width as my group here, which if I click on that group, I can see that it has a maximum width of 600 pixels. So if I select on my red group, I'm also gonna set the maximum width to be 600 pixels. I can then horizontally align this in the center of my page here, and look, while we're here, I can also add 30 pixels of margin at the top, so that way it doesn't directly touch my navigation menu. Now, as I mentioned, inside of this group, we're gonna add a bunch of different groups that are going to create our progress bar. So the first thing we'll need to do is add another group inside of this group. And what's really important here is that we take the time to update the naming conventions of each of the groups inside of my progress bar. So what I'm actually gonna call this group is group progress circle one. And look, I can see I just have a small typo there, but this is going to be the very first circle you see inside of the progress bar. And so what we need to do is make this look like a circle. So if we jump to our appearance tab here, we're going to just attach the default style of this group. I'm gonna scroll on down and I'm gonna give this a solid border to start with. Now for the roundness of this border, I'm also gonna make it a hundred. So it becomes a perfect circle. I'll then jump over to my layout tab. And for the container layout of this group, I can either choose between a row or a column. Inside of this group, I'm gonna add one element and that's just a text element which displays the number. And that number will of course be number one because we're in group number one here. Now look, personally, I'm just gonna select the row option, but you wouldn't be entirely wrong if you selected the column choice. Now, while we're in our layout tab, we're gonna head down to our width here and we're gonna set this to be 40 pixels. Now I am gonna keep this as a fixed value because I only ever want this to be 40 pixels, no larger and no smaller. And they're gonna do the exact same thing for the height. I'm gonna set the minimum height here to be 40, but I'm gonna tick that this should be a fixed height. So right now, this will always be 40 pixels by 40 pixels. I can then vertically align this in the center of my red group. And then inside of this group, I need to add that text element to display the number. So if I scroll on up to my visual elements, I'm gonna grab a text element here. 
I'll add this into that group and I'm just gonna type in the number one. Now for this text, I'm also gonna scroll in down to my styling, detach the default style, because I'd like to bold this number as well as align this in the center of the actual text element itself. But as you can see, we also need to update the layout settings for this text element because it sits outside of my group. So if we jump to our layout tab here, we can unselect that this should be a fixed width. We can set the minimum width to be zero, which now means it's going to collapse around all of the text inside of it, which is just one number, and it's going to fit inside of my other group. We'll then need to do the exact same thing for the height. So I'm gonna set that to be zero and it will also collapse around that number. I'll then vertically align this in the center of my group. And if I really wanted to make sure that this number is centered, I could select on the group. So group progress circle number one, and I could update its container alignment to also be centered to make sure it's horizontally centered. And look, as you can see, the first section of our progress bar is coming together. What I'm then gonna do is make two copies of this group. So I'm gonna make a copy, select in my red group, paste it in, I'll select in my red group again and paste in another version. And of course, the first thing I'll need to do is update the naming conventions for each group. So for our second group here, I'm gonna call this group progress circle number two. I'll then update the number inside of this group. So if I select on the text element, I can update this to the number two. We'll then do the exact same thing for our third group. So we'll update the name here to be group progress circle three, and we'll select on the text inside of this and I'll make this display the number three. And so right now we have all of our circle groups, but we need that little line that sits in between these. So how can we do that? We can add yet another group into the mix. So if we scroll on down to our containers menu, I'm gonna grab yet another group and I'll add this between my first and second circle. Now for this group, I'm gonna update the name of this and call this group progress bar number one, because this is going to look like a long bar, not a circle. I'll then scroll on down to my styling and detach the default style of this. And what I wanna do is add a solid border around this. But instead of setting a solid border around every single edge of this group, I only wanna set the solid border on the top and the bottom. And the reason I'm doing that is because I want my sides to look like they actually connect with my circles. And so the way we can do that is by ticking this option to define each border independently. And all we need to do is just make sure we set the top and the bottom borders to be solid. So for my top border, I'll make the solid. If I scroll on down for my bottom border, I'll also make that solid. Then from here, we obviously need to update the dimensions of this group because right now it's absolutely huge. So if we jump to our layout tab, what we need to do is first of all, update the container layout. And look, we're not adding any elements into this. So it doesn't really matter which option you select, but in order to get the options to update the height of this group, you need to select from something like a row or a column. And as you see, when I select the row option, we now have the ability to update all of the width and the height. So for the width of this group, I'm gonna uncheck that this should be a fixed width. I'm gonna set the minimum width to be zero and leave the maximum width as infinite. So right now it's gonna take up as little or as much space as it can inside of my red group. For the height, I'm gonna set the minimum height to be 10 pixels, and I'm gonna tick this option to make this a fixed height. So now it will always be this exact size you see here. And as you can see, it started to take the shape of a bar. I'm then gonna vertically align this in the center of my group. And right now you can see it's connecting these two circles. So what I need to do is make a copy of this bar, paste it into my red group, and just move this between my second and third circle. So if I head to my layout tab for my new group here, the first thing I'll need to do is just update the title of this. I'm gonna call this group progress bar two because it's the second progress bar within my red group. I'll then move this to the previous position and as you'll now see, it's going to sit perfectly in between circle number two and circle number three. And look, that is all of the elements we need to add inside of this group. So what I'm gonna do is select on the red group itself. So this is my overall group progress bar, and I can now set the minimum height to be zero. And because we have this default option selected to fit the height of this group to the content inside of it, it's going to collapse quite nicely around all of those elements. And so right now for our progress bar, we built out the design of this, but we need to make it fully functional. So as I mentioned before, what I'd like to do is create a series of conditions on all of my groups that sit inside of my red group and just recognize when each of the steps within my custom state is currently yes, we should have these groups display a color accordingly. So what I'm gonna do is first of all, select on my first circle. So group progress circle number one, and I'm gonna head to my conditional tab and I'm just gonna recognize when the custom state stored in my page, 
So I'm gonna grab my overall page here when the display group number one custom state is in fact yes, which of course it is by default. What I'd like to do is update the background style and I'm gonna set this to be a flat color. Then from here, if I open up the property dropdown menu again and type in the word color, I can update the background color. And in this case, I'm just gonna make this a shade of orange that I have. But look, you can make this whatever color you want. You can make it green, you can make it ombre to your app. But when I choose to toggle this condition on and off, this is what it's going to look like. Now, because I'm making this a shade of orange, what I'd also just like to do is update the color of my text to be white, because right now I don't really like the look of it. I want it to match my navigation menu, which has white text within my orange group. So what I'm gonna do is select on my text element. So this is text number one, and I'm gonna recreate the exact same condition. So I'm just gonna recognize when my overall page, when the display group number one state is yes, I'm gonna update the font color, and I'm now gonna set this to be white, and I can choose to toggle this on and off to see what that's going to look like. Then from here, if we move along to the progress bar, so this is progress bar number one, I only want this to be displayed when the display group number two custom state is yes. So I'm gonna define a condition, and I'm gonna recognize when the overall page, when the display group number two custom state is in fact yes. I'd like to first of all, give this a background color. So I'm gonna update the background style and set that to be a flat color. Then if I type in the word color, I'm gonna update the background color itself and make this the same shade of orange that I used before. And then I'm gonna create the exact same condition for the circle group beside this. And look, in order to streamline that process, what I can actually do is right click on this condition and copy it. So I don't have to build it from scratch every time. I can then select on my second circle here. I'll then right click and choose to paste this condition in. And so that's automatically taken care of updating the color of this. But of course, I need to create the condition that's gonna update the color of the text inside of it. So I'm gonna select on the text here for the number two. I will right click and paste in the same condition. But look, instead of updating the background style, all I'm interested in doing is updating the font color. I'm gonna set this to be white. And then from here, we're gonna to need to create the exact same condition for our second progress bar, as well as the third circle group. So what I could do is head to my conditional tab, right click, paste this in, and the only thing we'll need to change here is the custom state we're referencing. So instead of referencing the display group number two state, we'll reference the display group number three state. And then we can do the exact same thing for our third circle. So I'm gonna click on this, open my conditional tab, right click and paste that in. And in this case, I'll just update the display group number three state. And of course, from here, the only other thing I need to do is select on the text element, right click, paste in that condition, set the group to be display group number three, and then I'm just going to update the font color here, and I'm gonna make this white. Now, if I was to run a preview of this form here, so I'm gonna click this preview button, it's gonna send me through to my page. At this point in time, our progress bar is about 99% of the way there. Although we've created all of our conditions, when I click this next button here, as you can see, the conditions are working as we've told them to. So when we're in step number two, both the progress bar and the actual circle are now orange. And when I click next again, the second progress bar and the third circle have been updated. So this is following the chain of events, but of course, as we go through each step, we want all of the existing steps to also be updated as well. So when we're on step three, step two and step one should also be colored in orange. So what we need to do is create a few additional conditions just to factor in for that scenario. So if we quickly just jump back into bubble, I'm just gonna click on my group progress circle number one here. And instead of rebuilding all of these conditions from scratch, we're just gonna simplify the process by copying and pasting them. So I'm gonna right click this condition and I'm gonna copy it. I'm then going to right click when I define a new condition and paste the same condition in. But all I need to do is update the custom state here. So when display group number two custom state is also yes, this group should still be orange. And then I'm gonna right click and paste in the exact same condition again, but just update this to be the display group number three. So if I just quickly move this up on my page and scroll on down, I'm gonna select that option. Now, if I quickly just refresh the preview of my page here, what you're gonna see is that when we select next, this group is still gonna be colored in, but of course we still need to update the text element that's going to sit inside of it as well. So if we jump back to our bubble editor, I'm gonna select on the text element, right click the condition, make a copy of it, 
right click again, paste it in. And when group number two is displayed, I still want this to be white. And then I'll paste in another condition. And when group number three is displayed, I also want this to still be white. Now you can see how this is going to be a bit tedious. We've got to factor in for every single scenario for every single group here. But look, it truly is just a matter of copying and pasting. So from here, we're gonna select on our first progress bar. So right now, this is only being colored when group number two is being displayed. Whereas I would also like this to be colored when group number three is being displayed. So what I'm gonna do is head to my conditional tab, right click, copy this, right click again, paste that in, and all I need to do is update this to be display group number three. So as you work through the chain of all the groups in our progress bar, you have to add less conditions. So it does get easier as we go along. I'll then need to do the exact same thing for my circle. So I'm gonna right click, paste the condition in, and I'll just update this. So when display group number three is currently set to yes, this will still be orange. And then we'll also need to update the text. So I'm gonna right click here, copy this existing condition, right click, paste that in and update this to be group number three. And look, I apologize if I'm running through this quite quickly, but it is just a matter of updating all of the custom states that we reference inside of each condition. And then for our second progress bar, this condition should suffice and the same for our third group. So let's jump over into our editor, refresh the page here. And now as you'll see, when I select next, it's gonna send me through to the next section and it'll highlight all of the existing steps we've already done. And then when we click next again, it's gonna send us through to our third step. And once again, all of the additional steps have still been filled in. And so that is how you can create your own custom progress bar from scratch. Look, as I mentioned, this was quite a tedious process and there are definitely plugins that can help you do this, but I've just found in the past that you can't really customize them the exact way that you want. So that's why I prefer to create mine from scratch itself. But look, if you got to the end of this tutorial, we've covered so damn much when it comes to multi-step forms. By this point, you should be an absolute master. So what I'm gonna do is just jump back to my Notion checklist, tick off that we've finished building out all of the steps when it comes to creating a custom progress bar. And that is absolutely everything I had to cover within this tutorial today. And just like that, you now understand everything there is to know about creating multi-step forms in Bubble. If you found this video useful, I'd always recommend hitting that subscribe button on my channel so that way you can be the first to know whenever I drop a new tutorial. In the meantime though, I just wanted to say a massive thank you for taking the time to watch this video and I wish you all of the best on your own no-code journey.